Hello, I'm Wes Turnbull, and welcome to Freemasons The Inside Story. First up, Roger Manderson introduces us to the organs used in the lodge rooms of the Dallas Brook Centre. People often say, what does music play in Freemasonry? Well, it has a big role in Freemasonry, but I suppose we could break it down into four components. The first is to provide movement music. So when a grand team enters, we have music that's playing to give them marching music so they can move together. And we find this at any grand installation, and we find this at normal installations. Anywhere where the grand team enters, we need a pretty important march to say this is something special and also to keep the grand team in step so they look good and it matches the music. The second role of music in Freemasonry is to accompany what we call the odes. Mostly the odes are based on hymn tunes and the words have been rewritten so that they suit our ceremony. So the organist there is an accompanist accompanying, providing an introduction, the key, the tempo for the brethren to sing. The third role of the organist in Freemasonry is to provide incidental music. And this can come in a variety of ways. When brethren are moving around the floor from one place to another, for example, when the minutes of a lodge meeting are taken by the deacon to the worshipful master, there's a little bit of time there where nothing much is happening except the walking and signing the minutes, so the organist plays a little quiet background music to fill in the spaces. And this happens very often when we have any sort of movement in the lodge, anything where there's a little bit of a pause, the music just takes the edge off to make it interesting. And at installations also, we have different officers who get invested with their jewel of office and the brethren who are investing them tell them what their office is all about and tell them what the jewel represents and how each office, whether it's secretary, treasurer, armourer, whatever, is very important. And we have a little bit of ritual for each office. Now what we as organists do is get perhaps a little bit humorous here and then if, for example, a treasurer is invested with his uh, jewel of office, Treasurer is all about the money in the lodge, so the organist might play something like money, 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 or something to do with that. So we start to lighten off and have a bit of fun. Ah, the role of the organ in Freemasonry, and why no other instruments? Well, we do have organs as the main supportive instrument for playing for the ceremonies, as I've explained before. We also have grand heralds and they're people who play the trumpets to give fanfares and accompany the songs. We have grand choristers who come along to sing. But the organs, the, the main instrument used, we don't have a grand violinist, we don't have a grand clarinetist or a grand electric guitarist. I think the history of Freemasonry, going back to the England, Scotland, Ireland, you go to a Freemason's temple and it's very much reverential. It has a feeling very similar to a church. No, we're not a religion, but we have that feeling. And the organ is the very instrument that in a church, it's often part of the architecture as it is here. It's the whole wall. That whole sound of the organ can permeate the whole of the temple. And that's probably why the organ's been the most 
common instrument. The different organs in the Dallas Brooks Centre represent, I suppose, three different styles of organ completely. This organ we're at at the moment is a theatre organ. Originally it was in the Brixton Astoria Theatre in London and it narrowly missed being bombed in 1941, World War II. It was then brought out to Sydney and a man was reassembling it and since then his health wasn't so good and it was moved out of here. Dallas Brooks Centre bought it and it's almost complete. As you've probably seen, the, the pipes up there are in the shape of the map of Victoria and uh, in the back as well as many, many pipes, we've got a piano, we've got cymbals and glockenspiels and xylophones and all sorts of things. So it's really all the bells and whistles of what they would call a theatre organ. In Lodge Room 1, there is a, an organ there, it's a Fincham organ. They, were, they make lots and lots of different sorts of organs and they have done for many years. It, I guess you'd call a classical organ. It has the pipes up in the wall, nowhere near as big as this but quite big, and the console is in the lodge room, two keyboards, and it provides you with a classical organ, a church organ, the sorts of sounds you hear there. It doesn't have the bells and the whistles and the glockenspiels and all, all those little things there. It's far more attuned to a, a church type sound. Then we have in the smaller lodge rooms, what I suppose we'd call chamber organs. Now these are also Fincham organs. The console has just one keyboard and a variety of stops and the pipes are all in front of you in a box and they just sit into the wall. So they're much smaller. They're still quite loud but they're a smaller organ and the player, there are no pedals, they just have the, the keyboard. Most recently, I guess, we've gone into the 21st century because in the, the uh, banquet room we have a, a clavinova, a Yamaha clavinova, and that's the, the direction music is going now. In fact, what I believe is uh, a couple of the lodge rooms that are new are having newer organs, which are electronic organs, but they use sampled organ sounds. So they're computer electronically digitally recorded organs from all over the world in cathedrals put into memory chips on the computer so when you play the organ you're actually playing an organ from maybe the other side of the world in a traditional sound so we're going the full circle from the traditional pipe organ now we're getting back to the electronic version of that and that's what's planned for the new Dallas Brooks Centre when it's made. By the beginning of 1850, Melbourne, with a population of around 20,000 people, had grown into a large and important town. Schools and churches had been established. Roads had been made and large areas had been set aside for parklands. And even residences had gas lighting. In 1851, two major events happened. Victoria established itself from the colony of New South Wales and gold was discovered. This led to a sudden and dramatic increase in the population. Within Freemasonry, there were two major results from this. Firstly, Masonry began to spread rapidly throughout Victoria. And secondly, the small yet significant number of very experienced Freemasons among the new arrivals corrected the inaccuracies and imported historical lectures about Freemasonry. Only after a stable community formed did a Masonic Lodge become a real possibility. The decade of 1849 till 1859 may have started off slowly, Masonically speaking, but towards the end Freemasonry entered upon an era of expansion. The number of lodges within the town of Melbourne began to slowly increase, while the future inner suburbs, then the outer suburbs, began to build small but stable communities and open their own first lodges. All the major gold towns gained lodges, sometimes more than one and a number of new and important community members joined Freemasonry, which would have a lasting influence 
on the future direction which Freemasonry would take. During this time, an important trend started to emerge in the growing Masonic community of Victoria. The desire for self-control, free from the constraints of England, Scotland and Ireland. This would, in later time, cultivate in the action of forming a sovereign grand body for Freemasonry in Victoria. Hi, I'm Jim Spreadborough and welcome to From the Archives. Got some special books here tonight. This is a volume of the Sacred Law, a Bible. And as you'll see, 1599. Beautiful. We've got to be very careful with this, of course. And you'll see some magnificent parts in there where the person at the time who had this actually wrote some more chapters into it, their own chapters of the Bible. But 1599, a magnificent treasure. And these books, we have about 24 of these. And they are quite heavy. And what they are, back in 1889, when the United Grand Lodge was formed in Victoria, they came out and every person had to be registered. And these were the books that they used. Absolutely magnificent. Look at the script writing. And here we had a history of the person who joined up with the United Grand Lodge of Victoria in 1889. We had their name, we had their address, where they come from, what lodge they were a member of. And when they had the actual complete records, about 11,000 of these particular brethren registered in these registers, then another register was made. And in those registers, similar to these, was what lodge they belonged to. And we had this sequence of all the members' names. But this, they belonged to lodge number two, or number one, or number five, or number seven, whatever case, and whatever number they had from the United Grand Lodge of Victoria. We have these, and we refer to these to a, a lot of times. People want to know about granddad and great uncle, etc. And we can find out a little bit more about them by just looking at these, these particular records and assessing where that brother was a Freemason, when he was a Freemason, how he was made a Freemason, and when. Some magnificent treasures from the archives. Joining me today on Freemasons, the inside story is Lincoln Weimer and Trent Collins. Lincoln and Trent, welcome to the show. Thanks, Thanks Ben. Lincoln, can I start with you? Uh, what made you join Freemasonry? My father was a Freemason uh, for 56 years, but the day he got his 50-year jewel, I didn't even know he was a Freemason. So I thought, what was it that this guy uh, enjoyed about Freemasonry that kept him going? And so I decided to join myself and see what it was all about. And Trent, what about you? How's your Freemasonry journey started? Yeah, look, Ben, I was looking to get involved in some sort of uh, charity or community organisation and uh, got chatting to an old member and uh, he suggested that I have a look at Freemasonry and went to an information evening, it ticked all the boxes and, uh, and that's where I am today. And Lincoln, you've got an important or serious role at the Lodge. What's that role at the moment? I'm a Worshipful Master at the moment and uh, I'm enjoying that quite immensely, it's good. And so what does that entail for you? What, what's extra about that role? Um, well I have to learn a lot of ritual, more so than I have in the past, but that's fantastic. Uh, I also have to manage the running of the Lodge with the Secretary and other gentlemen within the Lodge. And, and what's it like to have the uh, esteem and, and the confidence placed in you by the members to be the Master for the Lodge? Oh, it feels great. Uh, some of these guys have been members for 50, 60 years. So for them to look at a guy in my age and say, yep, we think you can be the master of us for 12 months is fantastic. It makes me feel great. And Trent, can I ask you, your journey in Freemasonry, is this something you aspire to or are you happy just where you're going at the moment? 
Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, one of the things that appeals to me about Freemasonry is there's very much a structured uh, progression and uh, at the moment I'm sort of doing a steward slash inner guard role and uh, hopefully one day I can move my uh, self into all the positions and one day be a worshipful master like Lincoln. Freemasonry is not about just the once a month meeting and being friends there, it's about being friends outside of Lodge as well. You're both friends through your sporting achievements, in particular the Ironman competitions. Trent, can I start with you, what's some of the synergies between uh, training for an Ironman competition and Freemasonry? Yeah, Ben, uh, I suppose the structure of Freemasonry helps in the, in the structure of training. Uh, you know, you need to be disciplined, you need to be disciplined at Lodge to learn ritual and, and those sorts of things as you do when you're out training. Um, they're probably the main things. And, and Lincoln, some of the things that resonate with you through, through both being a Freemason and then training and technique and things like that. Well, with training uh, for an Ironman, you have to have a fair bit of structure to get your um, mind and body ready for the event. And it's a bit like Freemasonry, where you have to get your uh, ritual in place and you have to do a lot of mental and rehearsing training for Freemasonry. Uh, no different with the Iron Man, except it, it's physical and mental. You've participated in an Iron Man event this year. Tell me what that was like, and tell me any of the support you received along the way. Okay, so I was uh, training for the Iron Man, and I knew Trent had done an Iron Man a couple of years ago. So I approached him and asked him to help me with a uh, training roster, because these sorts of events aren't the sort of thing I do every day. That's for sure. Uh, Trent gave me a 20-week program to follow and I did the event this year and I was, uh, it's obviously a long event with a 3.8k swim followed by a 180 kilometre bike ride and at the end of it's a 42.2 kilometre marathon. So being not the greatest athlete on the planet, uh, I, it was dark by the time I was halfway through the marathon and I'm running along Beach Road towards St Kilda and I was all by myself because all the good athletes had passed me and gone into the city well before I had and uh, next thing this guy on the hill started yelling my name out and I thought who's this I can't see because it's dark and as I got closer it was uh, Trent from my lodge and he had been watching me over the internet on the Ironman website throughout the day and seeing where I was how I was going and he decided to drive his car into St Kilda from Donvale grabbed his bike, rode out along the marathon track, met me at the 33k mark and uh, decided to help me over those last 10 or so kilometres, um, encouraging, giving me encouraging words to help me get over the line, which was fa just fantastic. And Trent, what did that mean for you to be there for Lincoln? Ben and I, uh, having experienced the Ironman myself in, in 2012, um, I was fortunate enough to have a lot of family and friends there to, uh, to push me along and, and get me through the event and sitting at home I was watching uh, Lincoln on the internet through the Athlete Tracker which was on the, uh, on the website and uh, what Lincoln hasn't told you is that a, a week earlier his wife gave birth to their second child so unfortunately Lincoln didn't have a lot of support out on the course because his wife was at home with their, their new baby and uh, I just knew how special it was to have someone out there and I thought I'd get out there and, uh, and, and support Lincoln. I knew that he didn't have any friends on the, on the course and, and it's, it's a real special moment to, to cross the line. It, it, as Lincoln said before, it's not only a physical uh, feat but it's very much a mental feat and, uh, and I knew in my Ironman it was around that 36 kilometre mark of the marathon where uh, your mind plays funny tricks on you. You know, you've been going all day and, and you question why you're doing it and you question whether you're going to make it or not. And, uh, and I thought Lincoln would be probably asking himself those questions. And, uh, and I know that, you know, by having someone there to just keep pushing him along, I, I knew he'd get through it. So that, that was the motivation for me, Ben. There's something deeper than this too, isn't there? There's, there's that aspect of having a brother in a time of need, which, which Freemasonry is about. It's, it's about having a friend who, who is there for you whenever you need it. And, and did you feel that on the course, Lincoln? Look, I did. I, I, I think uh, the sort of traits that you pick up in Freemasonry is already instilled in Trent, in myself and a lot of my friends and family because of the way we are. But 
it really strengthens it through Freemasonry. And I thought on that day, I'd only known Trent for a couple of years, um, and just for him to have done what a lot of other people mightn't have done on that day for somebody he's only met a couple of years ago was brilliant, and, it, and that really spurred me on, it did. Trent, advice for people wanting to be an Ironman or participate in an Ironman competition? It's all about preparation. Uh, to enjoy the day, you, you need to do all the work prior to, so uh, anyone interested, you need to do the work. It's all about getting the Ks in the legs, both on the bike and running, um, to make that day even more memorable. Uh, the last thing you want to do is cross the finish line and, and collapse in a heap. You want to actually be able to enjoy it, and, and by enjoying it, it's all about the preparation. And Lincoln, finally with you, if anyone has any uh, thoughts on joining Freemasonry out there, what would your advice be? Well, my advice would be uh, to look up the Freemasons Victoria website if they don't know a Freemason. But I think if they know a Freemason, that they should openly go and speak to them about it and get some uh, real Masonic advice about joining Freemasonry. If not, hit the website and, and contact Freemasons Victoria. Well, Lincoln and Trent, thanks for joining us on Freemasons Inside Story today. Thanks, thanks ben. ben. Thanks for joining us. To find out more about Freemasonry, visit the Freemasons Victoria website at www.freemasonsvic.net.au or phone us on 1800 Freemason. You can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, Flickr, LinkedIn and Google+. Next week we chat with Grandmaster Hillel Benedict, his wife Sue, Deputy Grandmaster Don Reynolds and his partner Maya. See you then. <laughs>